Hey guys, this is Craig Migliaccio from AC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is how to tell what the problem is when you have a frozen evaporator quill. So I'm going to be going over some of the indicators to tell which of the three problems it could be, and these three problems are low refrigerant charge, low indoor airflow, or liquid lime restriction. When you arrive at the site and if the evaporator quill is still frozen at the indoor unit, you can hook up your gauges and continue to let that run and check your subcoin. You're also going to need to know what refrigerants in the unit, but in this instance it's R410A and on our red gauge we read 235 PSIG. If we bring that into the saturated temperature on the inner ring for R410A we read 80 degrees. On our temp meter on the liquid line if we only read 78 degrees then we know that the subcoin is only 2 degrees. So its subcoin is the saturated temperature of 80 degrees minus 78 degrees and that equals 2 degrees of subcoin. When you have a subcoin that's that low, you know that you are low on refrigerant even before you defrost that evaporator coil. So if it's only one, two, three degrees of subcoin, then you can determine that the problem is not a low airflow problem and it's not a liquid line restriction problem. So we normally check the refrigerant charge of a TXV with subcoin, and we check the refrigerant charge of a fixed orifice system that has, a, say, a piston or a capillary tube. We check the total superheat with the blue gauge and the, the vapor line. However, you're going to be able to tell that the system is low in refrigerant just based on that very, very low subcoin. Now say instead we had a pressure of 297 PSIG and we bring that into the inner ring for R410A and we find a saturated temperature of 95 degrees. And on our temp meter on the liquid line, say we read 85 degrees. That means that we have 10 degrees of subcoin. So if you read that, then you know that you're not low on refrigerant. So you know that that's not the problem. The next thing that you need to do is to defrost that, that evaporator quill. So you need to make sure that you turn that compressor off and either wait or try to defrost that quill somehow. After that's completely defrosted, the first thing that you want to do is to check for airflow. We have some videos for checking airflow, such as a temporized formula. If you had a, a air handler with electric resistance in it, and we have videos on checking the static pressure for the TESP, which is a total external static pressure, and comparing that to the manufacturer's data. We have another video on checking the airflow with the hot wire anemometer. You can also check it with a rotating vein anemometer or with a flow capture hood. So right there, you should be able to determine if you have a low airflow problem right there. But anyway, if we were to go ahead and turn the system on when you have a, a defrosted evaporator coil, we're going to also need to know if we have a TXV metering device or a fixed orifice metering device such as a piston or capillary tube. So you're going to be able to see that at the indoor evaporator coil. Now if the system had a liquid line restriction problem, it's not going to matter really what type of metering device you have. A liquid line restriction problem could be that you have a, a clogged strainer by the metering device or maybe a clogged filter dryer or maybe a clogged metering device such as a TXV that's lost its bulb pressure and is no longer opening properly. But the indicators for liquid line restriction problem are going to be the same regardless of whether you have a fixed orifice or a TXV. However, the indicators are different for a low airflow problem. So the first thing that you're going to monitor within the first few minutes of runtime, once you get that system up and running, is the vapor pressure. So you're going to look at the vapor pressure, and in this instance we have a vapor pressure on the blue gauge of 97 PSIG. We bring that into the inner ring for R4 tonight, because the system has R4 tonight refrigerant inside, and we read 30 degrees as a saturated temperature. If we had a temperature on the vapor line of, say, 65 degrees, then we know that we have 35 degrees of superheat, and that's a high superheat. So if we had a high superheat, that's an indicator of a liquid line restriction problem and not low indoor airflow. If we have a TXV as the metering device and we have a saturated temperature of 30 degrees and on the vapor line we read a temperature of say 44 degrees, then that's only 14 degrees of superheat. And that's a, a kind of a normal superheat and the TXV is going to be able to hold that superheat fairly steady even if you have a low indoor airflow problem. It's not going to be able to hold it if there's no airflow whatsoever, but in a slightly low airflow situation, that TXV is going to be able to hold that superheat correctly, somewhere between, say, 10, 14 degrees, or maybe 8 to 17 degrees. It's going to be somewhere probably in that range there. Remember, at the outdoor unit, we are checking total superheat because we're, we're not able to check a pressure and convert it to saturated temperature right by the evaporator quill. We have to check our refrigerant charge with the available pressure port at the outdoor unit, so that's referred to as total superheat. So we already have an idea of where we're heading with this just by the superheat reading. 
For a low airflow problem, your subcooling measured on your red gauge and on your liquid line is going to be probably normal to high, and for a liquid line restriction, it's going to be high. If you look at the red liquid gauge and you read a pressure of 297 PSIG, you can bring that into the inner ring for R4 Tanay and you see 95 degrees saturated temperature. Then you read the line temperature on the liquid line and you read 80 degrees. That would be 95 degrees saturated temperature minus 80 degrees line temperature and that leaves you with 15 degrees of subcooling. And that's a little high. It's not, it's not astronomically high, um, but that can kind of lean towards a, a liquid line restriction problem. But once again, the subcooling is not going to give you too, too much information. You know, you might read, say, a saturated temperature of 95 degrees and an actual line temperature of 85 degrees, then that leaves you with 10 degrees of subcooling. And that would be kind of a normal subcooling. So once again, you really want to rely on your, on your total superheat on this. You can also go inside and check your delta T. When you have a liquid line restriction problem, you're going to have a low delta T. So in the return, we have a temperature of 72 degrees. And in the supply, we have a temperature of 60 degrees. So that leaves us with a delta T of only 12 degrees. So that will be an indicator of a liquid line restriction problem. We're not able to get enough refrigerant to the evaporator coil to absorb the heat in the house. Therefore, we have a very low delta T. For a low airflow problem, the TXV is able to monitor and hold the superheat and so if we read, say, 72 degrees on the return, then we might get a measurement on the supply, in this case, of 54 degrees. So that means that we have a delta T of 18 degrees. So if you have a normal or maybe high delta T, that would be a low indoor airflow problem. Both the vapor sat temp and the liquid sat temp on the gauges are going to be low, regardless of whether you have a low indoor airflow problem or liquid line restriction problem. And that's because you're really just, you're not absorbing much of the heat from the, the inside of the building. So now let's move on to a fixed orifice. So if you have a fixed orifice metering device, you're gonna have the same thing. Your, your liquid line restriction problem is gonna have a high superheat, a high subcooling, a low delta T, and low vapor set temp, and, and a low liquid set temp. But if you have a low indoor airflow problem, the superheat's gonna be low. So let's look at the blue vapor gauge. And if we read a pressure there of 97 PSIG, and we convert that to 30 degrees, and on the vapor line, we read a temperature of 33 degrees, then that means that we have 33 degrees as our line temp minus our 30 degrees as our saturated temp, and we're left with three degrees of total superheat. So that's very, very low. If on our temp meter, we read a temperature of say 65 or say even 70 degrees, say we read 70 degrees as our, our line temp, 70 degrees minus 30, and we're left with 40 degrees of total superheat. So if you have a high total superheat, you know you have a liquid line restriction problem. If you have a low total superheat, then you know you have a low indoor airflow problem. So you gotta remember that the fixed orifice is not going to be able to slow down the amount of refrigerant that's heading into that evaporator coil, so you're still gonna be flooding that evaporator coil with low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant, and it's absorbing the heat from the air, and you're just not left with a, with a lot of superheat. It's very low. Whereas a liquid line restriction would mean that it's, it's slowing down the flow of the liquid refrigerant into the evaporator coil. And when you don't have much refrigerant in the evaporator coil to absorb the heat load in the house, the superheat is going to be very high. If we go into the house and we read a return temperature of, say, 74 degrees, and we read a temperature on the supply of 50 degrees, then that's 24 degrees as a delta T, and that's high. That's a telltale indicator that we have a low indoor airflow problem if it's a fixed orifice system. If our delta T is low and we have a uh, return temperature of 74 degrees, but we only have a supply temperature of say 61 degrees, then that means that we have 13 degrees as our delta T and that's low. In a liquid line restriction problem, you may even have say eight degrees or nine degrees as a delta T. It's gonna be real low. If you want to learn more about troubleshooting air conditioning systems, check out our book. And the book is written in layman's terms, so it's, it's easy to understand, even if you're just coming into the trade and you're new. We take you through from the, the beginning, like how the system works with the refrigeration cycle, how to check the refrigerant charge, and then we move into the troubleshooting aspects. So there's some in there for just about everybody. You can check out our book and the quick reference cards over at our website at acservicestick.com. And we also have these products available over at amazon.com. You can also check out our workbook, which is a thousand questions that will help you understand and apply what we're teaching in the book. And that workbook comes with an answer key, so it's a self-study edition. 
You can also get our book as an ebook, and that's available over at Google Play and also at our website, acservicetick.com. If you want to learn more about what we do, check out acservicetick.com and also facebook.com slash acservicetick. Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AEC Service Tech Channel.